Are we live? <laughs> I think we're live. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Sheffield Doc Fest. Um, this talk is part of Sheffield Doc Fest, Sheffield Doc Fest yeah. Arts Program. And this year's festival is a hybrid festival with some exhibitions and events being held in physical venues in Sheffield and virtually everything, including the online only exhibitions and events are viewable at arts.chef.fest.com. The arts programme is both online and in person uh, and it's free and open to all and it's supported by Arts Council England. This weekend, there are a couple of other talks as part of the arts programme. Tonight at 6pm, Emily Chow and Al Wong will be, will be in conversation. And tomorrow at 1pm, there'll be notes from the field working strategies for non-fiction artists. Between Remin Reminiscence and Reactivation is a conversation framed around artists whose, whose work with archival materials has led to cross-generational reflections and exchange of new ideas. The four participants with practices ranging across writing, film exhibition, moving image and performance will outline their experience working with archives and focus on how they share their contemporary perspectives on these materials. Uh, my name is Miriam and I'm going to be chairing today's session um, and I'm delighted to have Yasmin Ben Abdullah, Courtney Stevens, Alison S.M. Kobayashi and Cyril Ansari with me here today. Um, so I am going to pass over to Courtney to introduce herself and then everyone else. Okay, thank you, Miriam. Um, thank you, Sheffield, for having us. Um, my name is Courtney Stevens. I am a nonfiction experimental filmmaker. I often, in the past, have worked with archives more in a kind of collage mode. Um, but over the past few years, I've been working on kind of a, collecting an archive of um, female amateur films shot by women while traveling um, in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and this is something that I've been presenting as a sort of live lecture performance um, and recently kind of coalesced as a, a film. Um, that, is my, that is my work with archives. I, I will pass it to Sita. Oh, hey, um, I'm Sita Ansari. I'm a visual artist. I worked a lot during a long time with embroidery and since a few years now I I do films uh, from archives I work a lot about heritage and and more and memory uh, especially for queer people uh, from the Arab region I um, I do photography as well in the same field and I run a space called Cinémathèque de Tanger in Morocco which is um, an art house and and archive uh, institution here in Morocco, and it's the only one here in this territory. And I'm really happy to be with you today. And maybe Yasmin. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yasmin. I am a filmmaker and visual artist. I work mostly with video and film, and I work around questions of memory, diaspora, heritage, rituals and body um, and I archive in different ways one through my practice because I do use a lot of archival images and footage as part of my work but also as part of a, um, an entirely decolonial movement here in Morocco to decolonize the archives from the institutions and I guess I'll pass it to Alison. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm Alison Kobayashi. I'm an interdisciplinary artist. So I like to keep it vague so I can do a lot of different things. But um, I do uh, film, video, uh, illustration, and most recently live performance. And I'm really interested in using found objects, adapting those things into these different forms. And often the found objects are banal in certain ways. So like an answering machine tape, or in the case of my last performance, say something funny. It's a recording that was made on a wire recorder by a family in the 1950s. Um, and I'm also going to say a shout out to Union Docs where I'm calling from now because their Wi-Fi is very powerful. Uh, it's the Center for Documentary Art in Brooklyn, which is where I'm calling from you all now. So pass it back to Miriam. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, 
Yeah, I guess maybe the first thing I wanted to talk about before we get into the kind of theoretical, more ephemeral side of things is just like the practical side of working with archives and working with archival material, because I guess you all kind of um, do this in different ways and some of it is more kind of personal or family archives and some of it is more kind of public archives. So I don't know, whoever wants to go first, um, maybe you want to talk about how these things, how and on a practical level you, you interact with these things in your work. Maybe Alison, since you were already introduced. Oh. In. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like a lot of the, the work that I start with is um, materials that belong to strangers and people who are quite unknown to me and distant from me and also people who are not public figures. They're very ordinary people who don't necessarily have like a, a ton of material in a public record of about them. So I, I think that in the past, a lot of my work was quite speculative and I was really using a, a document, like for example, in the piece Dan Carter that I made, it's an answering machine. So I was really just using the audio and content of the answering machine to understand this person and kind of use that audio as kind of like this accidental archive that's made by someone by being alive. Um, and then in the case of Say Something Bunny, which is, uh, was a very different approach, which was more heavily researched, um, but also about normal people who a lot of them passed away before the internet was invented, like the archives that I had to, uh, you know, engage with to understand their lives were, were more kind of the archives that are made about everyone, like the, the census. And um, so it's, it's always this act of um, speculation in both cases, whether it's researched or um, not like just using raw material and and like and source material as the only material that i know about these strangers um and and just kind of imagining who they are by piecing these little things together so the work is often quite imaginative although sometimes researched <laughs> i'll pass it on to cedo <laughs> hey hey yeah well i uh, actually, I, I started uh, working with archives when I started working uh, at the Cinematheque and this is where I, I discovered all this universe and I also discovered that here in Morocco we don't have this accessibility to archives easily and uh, we don't have, it's really expensive to, uh, to digitalize for example and it's uh, very hard to find what you're looking for or what is um, surrounded by censorship or uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea was to, uh, and is to create or recreate this, this memory that we are lost in or, or, we, did, uh, or we, all, we already lost. And this is how, this is what I, what I try to do in my films, for example, to imagine uh, fiction characters and at the same time use real things and real archives just to give a voice uh, to people already not here anymore. And for example, for queer people, when you see in in, in countries uh, for Euro, in Europe, for instance, and you see that they don't have an official queer archives uh, yet. So you can imagine how here in Morocco, we are very, very far of this uh, for Moroccans and for Moroccans or Arab people in the diaspora. So this is why what I'm trying to create in my work, this this memory and this heritage maybe for 10 years or 20 years, and to say that we uh, we exist now and uh, and we did before, it's not something new, it's not something hype, but just we have to say it. And that's um, it, maybe Courtney <laughs> can sure. complete yeah. me. Yeah, it's interesting. I think similarly in in the work with with travelogues, some of the some of the effort in doing that is trying to draw a circle around you know something that otherwise hasn't been collected altogether. Um, so with that work, it's been you know a real kind of varied sense of sort of high and low. I mean, stuff that found on eBay, you know, 
commensurate with stuff that's you know located in kind of um, the Empire and Commonwealth Museum in, in England that collects kind of colonial travelogues. I mean, all ranges of these were sort of relevant for this project that I was trying to put together. And, and I think the the kind of it's not a devaluation, but the kind of varied valuations of this material was, you know, sort of part of the nature of that project. Um, so, so yeah, I've worked with lots of institutions like Harvard Film Archive, uh, the clip we might watch later, they control that, the work by this woman, Carrie Wagner, but, um, places. but I think, I think outside of this work, in working with other kinds of material for, for more experimental films, I think I'm, I'm, I'm also frequently working with material that's kind of impersonal material. So I've made films with um, medical training videos um, and other kinds of stuff that isn't sort of meant to be purposed towards any sort of emotional uh, revelation and trying to look at what some of that kind of material that's true kind of detritus in the, in the culture um, and doesn't sort of have cinematic value can, can tell us about uh, the emotional kind of world of, you know, usually this country where I'm, where I'm kind of sourcing from. Oh, and I will pass it to Stephanie, of course. It's so interesting to, to hear you talk about this, Courtney, because I feel like you and I have a very similar, I mean, space that we're navigating because we both work in Morocco and with Moroccan Archive, but I, it's interesting to see how those things are echoed in other spaces, um, including the U.S., but UK and, and another. Um, and in my practice, I've also thought about what it is to work with archive and so material from the past when you're in some political context trying to actually just keep an archive of the present because it is being erased as you are doing your work. Um, so a project I, I work on uh, called Sujente Social Su Aroma um, that Palestine, there was a, I didn't know that I was going for that. I felt like I was going to work around past fantasized and romanticized visions of Palestine from diasporic perspectives. And upon arriving there, I realized that there was, I mean, I knew that there was erasure and that it is continuous and happening right now. But then there was this question of how do we relate to both images of the past, but also images of the present um, as an archive for future generations. And so this non-linearity of time that I think we can find in each of our works is something that I'm really intrigued by. And I think, yeah, I mean, it is the question of reminiscence and a reaction and how do you balance between the two when there's so much work to be done with the past, but also so much with the present and the future. Yeah. I think that makes me think of um, something that came up when we spoke before, which was this question of like, how can we be inventive um, when like a visual memory doesn't necessarily exist? So whether that is like what has happened in the past or like what is happening in the in the present, how how do we like reimagine these things or like even take the shell of an idea and flesh it out? from something from the archives, um, which I think is, you know, something that you all kind of do in your in your work. As under thing to think about that. Yeah, I guess I mean you did mention it earlier, but uh, the idea of fiction I think is something we all play with and work with. And I mean reenactment, um, replaying, repurposing and fiction happens to be like a great tool to do that and to um, also tell, I guess the part of, of archive that's tale, because with images or material that we don't really have access to, um, tale becomes a huge part of the process. And so honoring that through fiction seems to be one of the most natural or organic ways to do so. Um, I definitely have, <laughs> I'm, I'm in between where fiction seems like such a great tool to me and then I catch myself and I'm like, yes, but you have to keep on fighting to have access to the archive too. Um, 
yeah, and just doing both at the same time, I guess. Yeah, and how how you 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 make fiction something universal, and and for example, I I when I work, I'm always looking for this little character, for example, in um, a book of uh, of the big generation written here in Tangier, and you have this character called Ahmed. I don't know, and this uh, I'm like. Who is Ahmed? I want to know more about this guy and what he did before and after. And I want a book or I want the story about this character. So this is how I try to imagine a story about uh, <clears throat> this kind of little uh, little Moroccan characters. And what is the scenario if uh, these people from the B generation asked them to write their own story and and how how what is this story and from my perspective as a moroccan living in morocco etc how how can i imagine something for uh, someone a foreigner coming here to morocco to do this sexual tourism slash residency slash uh, drug sessions etc etc and 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 this is how i can uh, i try to put some fiction in my work I think it's so interesting. I, I'm kind of thinking about um, researching the for, for say something bunny, and then I'm like, there's so much fiction in the archive, and like I part of the process was um, one of the biggest sources of information about one of the characters was his alumni, like his college alumni newspaper, and where you would write in and give them updates about what you were doing, and he obviously wrote it about himself, and like you want to project that you're a success and you're doing all these things and like everything's great and it wasn't you know like I know from other documents that it wasn't so easy and you know and so there's just ways that I, I love that you're constantly having to interpret that people are presenting their own mythology and fictions in the archive in the documents that we then look to as like the record of the past. Mm. I'm wondering if it's possible at this point to have a to have a clip, um, just so we can kind of understand the audience to understand what we're talking about. Um, so maybe if we have a have a clip from say something bunny. Sure. By Alison Kobe. I might. I might just set it up. So yeah, say something bunny. It's a live performance, and this is a little bit into the performance and. Uh, just to set up, the the performance is in this structure of an actor's read-through in the audience. It sits around a big table and each of them is assigned to different characters from this found recording. So when you go into the clip, we're going to hear a little bit of the quality of the recording and then it's going to go into me talking about it. So. <laughs> No, well, Absolutely Juliet, nothing. Juliet, I know you play tonight, Juliet. It doesn't make a difference. Why don't you take a couple of chairs from Juliet? No, as a matter of fact, Claire. Uh, so the evening is coming to a close, and you all have to make a collective decision as to what you will do next. Um, Juliet, you really want to play Canasta. You are very good at Canasta, and you often win. It's a moment that you relish being the center of attention, something that doesn't happen as often as you'd like. Then I have a theory. It goes back to your childhood. You were a very beautiful and charming child. Uh, people were constantly fawning all over you, um, so much so that at the age of six, you were cast in a silent film. Um, I found out that you were actually a child actress in a bunch of silent films in 1919. Uh, some of the titles were uh, Woman and Wife, When Men Betray, and
American Picture Studio Directory, 1919, page 162. Note to Casting Department. See physical description of Juliet dancing and child parts. Height, 3 foot 6, weight 47, fair complexion, blonde hair, blue eyes. Uh, <laughs> also, just to explain, the audience is given a transcript of the original recording, and as they're listening to the transcript, they can follow along with what the characters are saying. And then there's also what you saw at the end was just an example of some archival material that's put into the script as little inserts and illustrations of kind of the scene that just happened. And also what we can see is like, mm -hmm. I guess, you recreating the material too and like inserting yourself in that. And inserting yourself in material which in some ways is quite um, ordinary almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I think that it's like, I think that the issue of il illustration is often like, it's difficult to take a, a material, maybe like in this case, a sound material and create imagery for it. So like, I think with the performance, we really were like, okay, I'm going to actually make it so that the the audience is imagining it in, in their mind. Like we do kind of have these like uh, pieces here and there, like these recreations and um the script and the archival material, but like kind of went against just doing like something like a full reenactment, which I think in theater is a big thing of doing verbatim theater where there's performers dressed up as characters and like re like just saying their lines for verbatim. But it was kind of like that the, the images happen in, in the audience's imagination and each person has like a different idea of what Juliet looks like and as, as an as an adult woman and they kind of see this picture of her as a child and then you kind of do that translation in your imagination. Um, so hoping that people kind of imagine, I guess, forcing the audience to do some work. Um, and Courtney, when we, we spoke before, you, you kind of spoke a bit about um, anonymous contributions and like to the archive. And um, I think the phrase you used was like losing the status of anonymous contributions. And so I guess from something that like isn't anonymous, from something that we've got like quite, quite a lot of details through like Alison's rigorous research to um, the more like anonymous um, contributions maybe in your work. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I think I think I ran into an interesting thing when trying to do the work of, you know, trying to kind of dig out stuff that hadn't had its kind of status um, acknowledged, um, which was what is kind of the nature of my visit to this material? Is it is it to try to so these amateur travelogues, they're, they, they kind of vary in their level of um, like feeling like random vacation footage versus kind of being strung together with titles and um, explanations and kind of uh, other sort of inserts in order to kind of tie together a story. So there is a lot of effort being made, but most of that effort is, in my read, not being made towards professionalism is not, you know, it, it from this time, it's not being made towards, you know, this is my reel and I want to get hired to make a documentary. <laughs> no, I mean, where these are being made for all kinds of different reasons. And I think, you know, in the in the question of fiction that's been coming up, I mean, a lot of the fiction for me was, or, you know, the, the fiction that I was having to kind of fill in was like, what was the, and what was wanted by these women, you know, in doing this work? Was it to preserve something in order to come home and show their, you know, have people gather in their living room and show them um, work? Or was it to try to, there was one woman who was wealthy and lived in a kind of small town in Maine, and she used to present these travel reels and kind of live lecture over them um, to her sort of small town full of people I think she felt would never travel and have the privilege that she had. So, um, but none of them were really about kind of I, I surmise making it into kind of the history books or making it into this sort of canonical space. And so I was left with this question of, if for me and trying to kind of dig them out, am I trying to sort of make a claim that this is sort of a lost tradition of documentary by women that we, that we need to review? Or, or is it more like, here are all these 
people who probably did not have the opportunity to enter professional life in this medium, um, but are nonetheless taking it up. And that actually says something more about kind of the nature of like latent intelligence and sensitivity widespread, not through, you know, that these are secret geniuses and, you know, I, I, I would like them acknowledged as such. It, it's sort of more about kind of, you know, I, I think amateur material really points to kind of the, just the complexity of, of lives, you know, in a larger sense. And, and so, um, yeah, so, I, so I've, I've struggled a little bit with kind of this idea of, of, of giving credit, you know, what does that look like? And I guess that goes maybe quite nicely into the thing of like personal archives or like uh, familial archives too, or like, um, maybe not even familial, but these like non-official archives and like the the purpose of what they were made for um, and the responsibility maybe that you have of like working with that material. I wonder if anyone wants to speak on that. Yeah, I, that's exactly what I was thinking about when listening to Courtney, um, because this idea of what, what was it meant for when it was made, and then what do we make of it today? Whether we have, whether we know those people, and or and maybe they are part of our family, or do you have a sort of lineage relationship to them, or whether they're they're strangers. Um, does ask that question of like our responsibility as artists in including those images and giving them maybe infusing them inevitably with our own interpretations and our own um, desires. And so I think about that a lot in more in, unfortunately in the concept of loss and loss of archive um, because I I think part of when I work with family art whether it's my family or someone else's with whom I'm working, there is enough information, but also enough emotional link uh, between the material and the work when, that I'm making. So I feel like it's less complicated <laughs> and less um, also challenging I guess, in a way. So it's interesting to see how you both, um, Allison and Courtney, relate to those kind of images and material but i do think about it in a lot in terms of loss a lot just because i mean we mentioned it before but in morocco there's um and obviously not official but it is a, there is a politics of forgetfulness and it is extremely hard to access archives and there are i mean we are they were colonial institutions that were maintained but today um, means that bureaucracy works in ways where archive gets lost. And so you have to go through all these folds and maybe not even get to the image at the end. And so just thinking about that and the responsibility to dig it out and then, um, then what do you make of it? Because it, by the time you get it, it has gained so much political importance, even if at the beginning it wasn't necessarily extremely political, be just because of the invisibility of it, and how hard you had to get to it. Um, so maybe the status of the image or the archive does change, not only with time, but just also in the process of finding it and unearthing it and getting it to be shared and worked into your work. Yeah, Cedro, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about your process of like unearthing that material um, and using, using, using the material that you use. Yeah, uh, I just finished, finished a project uh, when I use um, some family archives, it's videos uh, and shootings uh, of me during uh, lunches, etc. And I was really interested, for example, to see how the person who was filming me, my dad or my mom, how the subjectivity and the image that they want, uh, they, they, they have in me is different that, uh, from the one to the, to the other. For example, we see in this little video that I 
I'm, I'm, I'm finishing right now is to, to see how, for example, when my father is shooting, is he, he's more uh, focusing about my face or my foot and my, and my mother. It, uh, she was about like all oh, my body and how I'm dancing and how I'm talking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I love this uh, subjectivity that we find uh, in in amateur archives. For example, we do a lot of amateur archives here at Cinematic because it's the it's important to have them. It's important to have this alternative narrative uh, in a position mm -hmm. of uh, the national and the governmental institutions. And we see how at the same time. Uh, people uh, are not professional doing their images, but at the same time, we have exactly the same information that we have in films. It means that the colonial one, still colonial, the local one, still local, etc., etc., and how how we reproduce as uh, normal people all this 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 mechanism of of um, uh, of doing images and how the subjectivity. Is still here, and you can't not be subjective when we do images. And this is how, what we 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 try to teach here to the children uh, when they come to the cinematic. Uh, we say that it's it, it's always a point of view. It's always a choice. And when you do an editing, just and when you choose like two images and one uh, before the other and the one after the other, it's not the same thing. And it's a choice that you made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is how, this is my question, the questions around my work and how, this is what also I work a lot of, uh, a, lot, a lot with editing uh, because it's something really, really interesting to, to ask and, 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 and um, yeah, and, and be a witness of this, uh, <clears throat> of this subjectivity. Sido, so, you know, in hearing you talk about your, <laughs> like your family's archive, I'm just like thinking about, um, what we all just think of worthy events to film. Like, I just feel like I'm thinking about my own family's archive, personal archive in the home video and how much of it is an event, like a, a ceremony or something like a graduation, like these things that we choose to record, which are the most boring parts of the, of my family archive, the best parts for me, in my opinion, are when my dad was like, I need to drain the battery before the, the event. And like, he would just film like to drain the battery with the intention to drain the battery what we were doing there which is like eating lunch like I think it's like those moments that I'm like these are my favorite parts because those actually capture the day-to-day -day versus like a swim lesson which is so boring but it's just it's interesting how we often as like amateur video makers in, in my family like reproduce what we think should be televised or something and i just noticed in my in my own family recordings and also in say something bunny this uh performing of commercials a lot like we would be just like say a jingle because we're like that's what you do when you're on camera as a child i don't know if you had similar things but um i'm just thinking about amateur home videos in our archives you know it's, it's really interesting because i mean there's such a Mm, there's such, I think, especially in kind of early amateur films, like not understanding the genre. And so, you know, trying to either replicate photography in the photo album or, you know, to try to do what happens in movies or, you know, to, and, and in, in travel footage, it gets really interesting because there, this question of originality is, becomes very political because, you know, people go to India and they're on, you know, multiple reels of footage of people shooting the exact same things because they're on the exact same tours and they're being shown the exact same things um you know and 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 so the visual cliches that are part of you know instagram today but also you know amateur footage of that time you know says something about the entire apparatus of tourism you know these kinds of routes mined through colonialism um, and so all of that stuff that is unoriginal in the material you know ends up having its own kind of political point, you know, um, about what to do with the, the sort of boringness of that is, is also, you know, as a, as a filmmaker trying to work with it, um, is, it can be a challenge. Yeah, I find it super interesting. It makes me think um, one of my first films was a really, really short documentary, but it was uh, with my dad. 
Um, Sido has watched it, but it was with my dad. And, and I love it. <laughs> Thank you. And it's about his love for travel. And so I had to like look at images that he made in the 1960s. And um, then I just was like looking from there and the images is still photography. So I think the relationship to still photography is also different from when home video was so available. Um, and so his images from the 60s are magical, truly. And then you see the unraveling in a way <laughs> of what he chooses to capture. Um, but then there's really beautiful, um, there are beautiful liminal spaces in those images where, yeah, he's going to whatever, um, and then emit the touristic bits you see how he, like his body is half in the water and he's filming his three daughters swimming towards him and laughing. And that's like the preciousness of that image rather than the building that he was filming right before. Um, but I, yeah, I feel, I find it so beautiful to just try to, and I guess like that, that's the, when you have availability of a lot of images to look at and you can just go in and find the small pieces that do speak to, bigger, more emotional, more anchored, um, yeah, experience it. Which I think like also goes back to this question of like, that someone um, when we spoke before said about um, the, the material in the archive isn't necessarily like what is the most beautiful, but like it's what has survived. I think that's something really interesting to think about too, about like, survival of the the archive and like that being um in some ways like very intentional in the fact that something was captured at all but in some ways also quite like up to chance one of the things that i was thinking of and also um just in all of your works and, and that making the work is kind of, it, it ch changes the archive. It makes it so that it exists in a different form and is kind of, um, I don't, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about like the moment in which a work is made in relationship to the archive and the way that making a work changes the archive. Um, there was one film that like I found that was very obscure and the only place that I found it was at Fales Library at NYU and it was a VHS. And because I asked to watch it, they then digitized it because they didn't want me to watch the VHS. They wanted me to watch it on DVD or something. Um, and so it was like in asking for it, that archive then became available in a different way. And also because some of, so much of the work with Say Something Bunny was uh, around the census. The census has this like 72 year rule where they don't release the census until 72 years later and that my project would have completely changed had it been done like six years later because like the census from the time that um, the recording was made would be out by then. But because I did it whatever number of years before, I only got the census from like 10 years before or something. So it, it completely changed the project. The project would be a completely different project had it been made at a different moment in time. And also looking back at some of my documents, like Mary, uh, Yasmin, I think you were saying that like, it's things disappear like and even just like links of research of things that like told me information about this family i clicked on it three years later and that link the website like that page is gone and i'm like what was that information like i didn't download it and so it's just this constant thing of like research and archives and disappearing and like and and that it is so devoted to the moment and the last thing i was just gonna say also with say something funny like the performance is about ordinary people. One of the people ended up becoming a playwright, but I really couldn't find, like I found stuff about him, but really had to dig for it. But if you, if someone sees the performance, they could make a Wikipedia page and be like, this playwright wrote this, this and this. And then like, there could be this like document that everyone can see and they're like, she didn't do too much research. She just found it on Wikipedia. So it's like interesting how this work can also make new archives and generate new ways of knowing stuff that previously before the work was done was just kind of like scattered. Yeah, and it's also hard to 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 choose what is 
archive and what it's not. For example, you were talking about this VHS students, for example, you have an artist who needs uh, a document and then you do um, you do it, but, but yeah, but sometimes it's really hard when you don't have enough money, of course, to do everything, and when you don't when you when you don't have all the equipment and um, the human resources, etc. Yeah, I, I feel like this is super interesting between what both of you have just said, um, but the idea of creating archive be, through your work and not not only in the process, but your work itself becoming archive. Um, and so it's interesting to hear like both the anecdote of the VHS and uh, the Wikipedia page that could exist. Um, but yeah, it's this idea of whatever you make becoming a source for someone else at some point. Um, and I do think that it's intimately linked to this idea of disappearance. And um, we have probably no way to know what what will be of our work in 50 years and how it will be maintained. We assume that because of the internet, it will be eternal, um, but we actually really don't know. <laughs> and so just how we relate to potential disappearance. And I think we spend so much, I mean, I can, I'll speak to myself, but I, I do think that a lot of people, at least a lot of young artists here in Morocco, have time working with the past because we have such a hard time um, making sense of it because we can't also officially interact with the present. And so in a way, we go find refuge in the past to be able to speak to the present. And currently struggling, <laughs> trying to figure out how to navigate all of that and disappearing archive and past and present and just seeing how we can create together material that can be used, hoping that future generations of artists can go and have not only models of work that uses archive, but also just the archive that has been made available for people to use. Um, and I think like thinking of those things also that we talked about before was like, um, yeah, the resources that are available to um, to make or maintain these archives. And um, if we think about those resources, if we think about like cataloging, for example, someone mentioned like metadata and what happens when something is lost or can't be found through this like metadata, like human error. Um, which I thought was like something really interesting to think about. It's like um, the intentionality uh, was there, the intention to save something was there, but because of this like human error, um, it, it has then become lost or unfound, which I think is something interesting to think about when things have been like purposefully been um, lost <laughs> um, and like the difference between those two things too. Um, yeah. I think we're also it's interesting just seeing like the subtitles appear too in this talk and just that, that you know the future is like artificial intelligence interpreting these archives and that like possibly a lot of this stuff will be available and interpreted by AI. Mm -hmm. which is another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is I mean it is interesting. It is about this um, idea of how how we relate to the future too um i i like the way you said it miriam purposefully being lost um i think it's it sums up pretty much the situation for me um uh, because i do think yeah like a lot of it is questions of preservation and you know a room was too hot and film was ruined but a lot of it also is purposefully not putting enough money into preservation <laughs> So that the film does get ruined, or um, actually preserving it and it being fine, but not revealing that it exists, or not being transparent enough. I mean, um, there's this film that just—I mean, it came out, about, I think, a year ago, but um, called—I don't know the English word, the English title, but it's uh, "Avant le plan du jour." I don't know before the sentiment of the day. Uh, the I film is out. Dawn of the day? Before the dawn of the day? I think it might be that. The Ali Asafi film? Yeah, Ali Asafi. And this is like a major, I mean, a major 
film for Morocco because we haven't had films that deal with the years of lead or at a lot of them. And the years of lead, just for a little bit of context, were this um, three decades um, period in Moroccan history marked by extreme state violence and scrutiny uh, and oppression and repression. And so the archive exists and we all know it because there were a series of trials that happened years later. But when you go to try to get it, it, you're told that it was lost. So even the question of loss as an excuse not to access um, is something that's interesting. And I know that we mentioned this last time when we were chatting, but the idea of how do you, well, how do you handle that first? Like, because it is completely out of our hands in a way, but also how do we approach then um, decolonizing the archive or decolonizing our approach to archive, even if it's without the institution? Um, we also have about 15 minutes left, so if anyone has any questions in the audience, please do send them through. Um, if you have any question you want to ask uh, our panelists? Um, but yeah, I think that's something that's really interesting, which is this thing of like you colonizing an archive and like how how is something I think about a lot about how is that possible? Um, it's about these um, trying to uh, undo something that was like m meant for different purposes. How do you uh, try to undo that or try to make something that like goes against that without like replicating that when like the structures of that are like what you have to work with, you know? There's so much to be done about just like recontextualizing the archives too. Like, I think that that's so, so much of that. Um, it's so much work and it's such an important thing that needs to be done. But just like, I think that there's just conversations that are happening in the last decade that are just like, how do we look at this information differently? Or like what we said before, how do we look at this information as fiction? How do we look at this colonial perspective as a, f a fiction of what was happening versus what was actually happening at that time. Yeah, and what is the uh, the the distance that we have uh, mm -hmm. from this archive, and is it too soon or not uh, to read it or to interpret it or not? And this is how uh, the context is very important, and how and what and. And storytelling is important to 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 give all the elements uh, to have to be able to read an image or a document, etc. Um, yeah. We have a question from the audience, which is: um, Are there any types of materials or artist practices that any of you think shouldn't be archived? Mm. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I I don't know necessarily if this is an answer as much as me echoing the question, <laughs> but um, I I do a lot with this question in terms of a relationship to orality and how I mean in, in our history in Morocco where we had thousands of years of oral tradition that was passed on and survived very well. But then colonization happened and a super brutal and fast modernization um, and forced modernization and exodus towards the city made, in, in addition to just going to trauma, made it that there was a huge rupture in that orality being passed down. And so something that I, um, grapple with a lot in my work is how to honor the orality and its ephemeral na nature and the fact that it can turn into tale and that's the beauty of it as well um and so maybe that shouldn't be archived but at the same time next to it knowing that there's such a loss of that orality that there needs to be a record and so just trying to honor both um sometimes is complicated but i do think about it a lot in terms of maybe 
part of it is oral and oral and not recorded, but another part is. So in order to leave that oral, also um, leave it to the people who attended it, or who experienced it, and who can then take it and turn it into tale the way orality was always meant to be. And then it, next to it, it has some sort of archive because we can't, we're not gonna go back to an entirely oral um, society. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. So grappling with this, I guess, is something that I, I know I'm not going to, to <laughs> resolve that kind of question, but I feel like that's what I... <laughs> yeah, I think I have just one thing to say. Don't don't throw away your, your family and your personal uh, uh, images, people. Please don't give it to you have a lot of artists and ONGs working with it and you have a lot of information in it. So just give it to people. If you don't want it anymore, just sell it if you want, but just uh, don't throw away all this material because it's really important. Well, I think also maybe the question too, and thinking about like that family material or um, yeah, is like who, who takes on responsibility for that uh one in a family and two like outside of traditional family structures like i think that's something that um you know queer people have been thinking about for a long time like who do you pass things on to um whose responsibility is it to to look after this material um yeah i think that it's interesting um, in, in doing this performance and doing this project about strangers. Um, sometimes people are like, why would you do this? And like mm -hmm. also feel it kind of makes them think about their own archive and when like in 60 years in the future, kind of what's going to happen to their Instagram feed or will someone do this to me in 60 years? And I think that what's really complicated about it all is like probably not. Like I think that the thing that's so complicated is like, that most of the stuff that is being generated about all of us is just going to be gone. And and, and I don't know if like thinking about the performance, like the perf if we're talking about like artwork and archives, like you guys saw a clip of the performance, but the archive is not the thing itself. The archive is like what it can exist outside of that moment. And so it's just like, I, I have a hard time with even like dealing with performance because I'm like, for this thing to continue to exist, like, do I have to do it? Do I need to get someone else to do it? Or does it just stop? And it just like, yeah, it means that like, you know, it can just exist in the memory of people. The the archive is the, the experience of it that is responsible for those who went to it. And maybe it comes up in like 60 years, maybe it just never comes up again. And I think that it's like ephemeral it's like there is something about an, an ephemeral experience. And I think that that makes it really exciting for me to do that with people is knowing that this is our time together and that's it. Um, you can come back to it, but it's not gonna be the same set of people. It's going to be different. But I do think it's really, I mean, it's interesting to hear Sita talk about, um, you know, sort of like gar guarding against, you know, the sort of um, against loss, you know, which is so real. And, and yet at the same time, it's like the I, I'm reading right now about handwriting. And so one one thing that I was recently reading about was kind of writers, um, uh, collections of letters and, you know, all of that, like how those kinds of legacy collections like get made and what is going to happen to that practice, you know, as, as Alison saying, you know, a few decades down the road when you have just, you know, a collection of emails, you know, what, how does that become a, a, a legacy for a writer? Um, not just because we don't romanticize emails in the same way that we romanticize handwritten things, but because they're private and they, they're not collected by the person in the same way. And, um, and so in this kind of like moment of acceleration where we're like, you know, generating, you know, I think I read we're generating more images, you know, humanity is generating more images every day than they did you know, in a decade, you know, or like 50 years ago. Um, so it's sort of like, or do, or will we just 
become perennially obsessed with the 20th century <laughs> because it was sort of a, I don't know, I, I think the, the balance between our ability to absorb and the amount that was being generated was kind of in tandem, <laughs> whereas now, you know, they're, they're just, um, it isn't the case, but such things I wonder about. I think that's so interesting. I mean, I think that just what stuff like if you if, I think that the thing what you're saying with the letters is it's curated it's like this is the pile this is the interesting thing and now people it's like this is my inbox it's like completely disorganized uncurated junk you just have to go through so much trash and that trash I think the thing that the thing I think for me I'm like the trash is interesting the trash is interesting you know um but it's it's overwhelming for most people if you have someone in your family pass away and you have to like deal with their apartment and their Netflix account and like all of this stuff. It's just like, it's so much at the same moment of dealing with grief that it really makes sense that like it happens in 60 years, but um, can we curate our own? Like, is there a way that we can curate our own lives to be like, this is the package. This is the thing that I want to sell on eBay. <laughs> See what you're saying or something like, this is the thing that I think is the, the thing worth we're looking at um, who's responsible for that or just give it with the trash like give everyone everything and let them dig through it that would be such an interesting experiment to now just when you sense life is almost over not to be too grim but just like what you decide <laughs> to be. But it's very official and structured in a way and you decide these are the images these are the moments that I think people should be able to use and should be, you know, and what's not, because actually if you're, if you die and then, I don't know, a descendant in any form, whether it's like family lineage or community or 56 years later, who never knew you decides to take those images, they get to do whatever they want with them. I mean, I don't know if it will really matter then to you, but <laughs> just thinking about also like I, echoing what you were talking about earlier, Courtney, of this responsibility towards the per person who made the image, just like accompanied curatorial texts of what those images are. <laughs> but then I guess that defeats the purpose also of the tale and a lot of the work that we do between fiction and um, the archival work. I, I read an interesting study that, uh, you know, when people cru cruise Instagram, they, they are left generally more depressed than before they did, um, you know, like almost across the board. But when people look through their own feed, that's a boost. They tend to be left in a, in a good mood after that because there's a, you know, the self curation of, um, of telling yourself what your life is, is, you know, is, is, is positive, <laughs> you know, um, but it, it doesn't, doesn't provide what you know. What are the what are the in between scenes? You know, it's Allison. I think everyone here is you know, talking about that. Um, that give value that the person you know can't can't see in themselves. That's so compelling. It's a really interesting thing to think about too. About how um, even the archive of your own feed is like uh, generated or. Um, uh, yeah, cared for differently. I remember speaking with someone who was like a like a few years younger than me. It was like you should only have like six photos on your Instagram at all times. And I was like, Well what do you do with it? Like where does it go? Like how do people know like who you are and what you've done or like how do you in that small space that is your mark? Like you're just like, Yeah, you are deleting it, you're deleting your own archive. It was a terrifying thought for me. But, the, but I mean, I'm so grateful I grew up in a time that my high school years aren't documented. <laughs> so I mean, I'm thrilled that that wasn't um, there to, to, I mean, I don't know. Deleting your own archive is like also a form of growth, isn't it? Yeah, um, it sounds like control over preservation and what we choose to keep around and give. Um, but it is a different perspective from someone who's an artist rather than someone else, I guess. And I guess in a way, this person who told you that they chose to show a certain part takes control over their own archive. It's so interesting, this 
thing that you guys are just bringing up just with the idea of like preservation in the archive and then also deleting one's own archive sometimes out of an act of preservation like i was just watching the sam j show and there's like this conversation about like deleting past instagram or twitter posts because you're like am i gonna get canceled for this or something and that also the deleting of one's own archive is also an act of preservation um for your future self and just mm -hmm. like changing that it's like the archive can sometimes hold in place who we were and like makes us beholden to that previous self um and deleting it is kind of like i'm i'm a different person now i don't know yeah uh, and you write like in your legacy yeah and which we all sorry <laughs> I'm gonna say it a nice note to to end on, but you go, Yasmin. You say your say what you're gonna say. say that it's also like we've always had access to that, right? Like, I mean, we were working with one of the teens in the residency, and uh, he was using images of his mother, and so we were looking at pictures, and then one of them was ripped in half because she didn't want to have the other person on the photo, which is such a common thing. I feel like my yeah. mom has that she's fond of and she ripped her face because she didn't like the way she looked but she wanted to keep the memory exactly so, mine too. <laughs> we we, um, we have always had the choice in how we curate our archive too and we really need to wrap up now um but thank you for joining us everyone thank you um to all the panelists for your interesting insights and contributions um yeah um I guess this is when we say bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Miriam, for hosting thank us and Sheffield. And all of you guys. Thanks. Bye.